Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Let's all stand for the reading of God's word. Didn't get as far as I wanted this morning. I have five points, so we're going to try to cram four in tonight. Now we'll get as far as we can. Um, it says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless. Father God, we thank you for your word, that it's a lamp unto our feet and light unto our path. And Lord, we just pray that it will just open up our hearts and minds and that we hear from you, that we hear from your word, and we just pray that your will be done. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn around and shake somebody's hand tonight. Do you believe tonight? Because in context of this morning's message and what we're going to talk about tonight, it really comes down to our belief. Do we believe that the Lord can heal? Do we believe he can change? Do, do we believe he can remove the guilt and the shame of our past? Do we believe and have enough faith that what the race that we're running, that there's a finish line that's worth it? Do you believe? This morning in our message, Straining for the Goal, we talked about letting go of the past and how vital and how important that is because it hinders us from moving forward. It hinders us from seeing the goal in front of us because we're constantly looking back and being reminded of the guilt and the shame of our past or we're, or we're looking back at our successes and we're too minded of the past to be any good in the present or in the future because we're just dwelling on what has been. But if you remember this morning and me talking about it in, in the text that we read that uh, Paul said, uh, but this one thing I do, he's actually doing two things at one time. So while he's forgetting the past, Paul is also pressing forward. He presses forward. Look again at our original text. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. So he's not looking behind him, but he's reaching forward to the things in front of him. What's in front of him? The promise of eternity. What's in front of him? The blessings of God. What's in front of him? His Lord Jesus Christ. He's reaching for those heavenly things. And as an individual and as a church body, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to leave the past where it's at and look forward. Stretch forward. Reach forth. Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind and and reaching forth now i said this morning that you know we kind of have it backwards where we start out the race strong we started out fast we're motivated we're excited and then as we run this race of christianity we start to dwindle down to unwind to fizzle out, to get distracted on the things on the left and right of us. We're not reaching forth. We're not reaching out. And tonight I ask you, are you reaching forth? In your life right now, in your walk with Christ, are you reaching out for the things of God? Or are you just content with where you're at? Are you content with what you're doing? As the runner of the race... Are you leaning in? Are you pressing forward, not paying attention to the distractions around you? In Philippians 3.14, Paul says, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Paul says he presses forward to the goal, to the finish line. Are you doing that tonight? 
Too many of us just go through the motions. We're saved. We know we're going to heaven. We have that confidence, but we just kind of leave it at there. We leave it with our justification and don't think about our sanctification, our walk with Christ, drawing close to Him, being close with Him, being in a relationship, answering the call into the ministry that He has for us. We don't think about what He has for us and for this church and for this community. We're just happy with coming in and going out. As long as the lights are on and the air is on, or if you're ready, if the heat's on, we don't have no other problems. We don't think about anything else. Do you give a thought about how you're reaching the community around you? Do you give a thought about those that are lost without Jesus Christ that are in, in your life around you, the people that you impact on a daily basis, the people that you run into, the people that you talk to? Do you give a thought to those people? Or are you just happy with just coming to church and going home? And coming to church and going home? Paul says he presses forward to the finish line. The goal of individually reaching heaven and eternity with Christ. That's the goal, is reaching heaven. The goal individually of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sharing your testimony. When was the last time you shared your testimony? That you came across somebody and there was a conversation and you could relate to that person because they are currently going through something that you've gone through before and you have a testimony to share with them about how Jesus brought you through that storm and that he can do the same thing for them. I'd say it's been far and few in between. You know, I, I love technology and I've said that before standing up here, but there's one thing technology has hindered, and that's a, com a conversation. People don't know how to talk to each other anymore. And Satan uses that. Because if, if I don't want to talk to you, and you don't want to talk to me, and we both got our heads on our phones or whatever, and we're not paying attention to each other, that means I'm not sharing the gospel with you. And you're not sharing your testimony with me. And he, like I said this morning, he's fine with that. He knows you're saved and he knows you're going to heaven. So he's happy with the fact that all you do is come in and sit on a pew and you don't make an impact for Christ. You don't do anything with your life. You don't do anything with your testimony. You don't share the gospel. Satan is very happy with that fact. Why does he say reach forth in 13 and press forward toward the mark in verse 14. Paul is expressing to the reader that the Christian life is not easy. It takes work. It takes effort. You can't just sit in one place and expect it all to happen around you. Too many churches are content with not having visitors. And what I mean by that, they, they have this philosophy that, well, they know where we're at and they'll come in if they want to. It don't happen like that anymore, folks. That was yesteryear. And I'm just being honest. There was a point in time where people thought, well, I need to go to church. Or I need to get right. Or I need to go do. It was commonplace for people to go to church. Anymore, it's commonplace for people to go stay at home and you're the crazy one for going to church. It's flipped. Especially if you go on a Sunday night and a Wednesday night. You mean you're going to church more than once a week? What are you doing? And so we can't sit here expect them to come to us when we're looked at as the crazy ones for coming to church in the first place because they're not going to come in here. We have to reach out to them. We have to press forward. It's not going to just happen. It's not going to fall in our laps. There must be an effort made. And there must be an effort made in our sanctification, our relationship with Christ. As I said this morning, just like two people in a marriage or in a relationship, and one person is clueless that there's problems in the marriage, then that's a problem. That means that person has made absolutely no effort in that relationship. Is that you tonight in your relationship with God? How much effort are you making? 
Holy Spirit is convicting you and screaming out, you need to spend more time with God. You need to stop being distracted. You need to read more of God's Word. You need to spend more time with Him. Your spirit is crying out for it and you're ignoring it. Well, there's not a problem. Or I'm too busy. Or I've got this going. I've got that going. I need to do this. I need to do that. And everything else is distracting you. Because you're not pressing forward and looking at the mark, which is Jesus Christ. You're being distracted by the world around you, by work and by everything else. We need to keep our eyes on the mark. We need to start looking, stop looking to the left and to the right. Those proverbial roses that are on the side of the road, you know everybody says stop and smell the roses? When it comes to the Christian walk, you don't have time to stop and smell the roses. Because those roses have thorns. Satan has put those roses there to distract you. You've got to run this race. You've got to press forward. You've got to lean into it. You don't have time to, to, to sit back and just smell the roses around you. You know when you're going to smell the roses? When you get to heaven. And those roses are going to smell good. And they're not going to have the thorns and the bees and everything else in them. That's when you stop and smell the roses. When you've crossed the finish line. Because those roses, that's actually the temptations. That's the temptation that Satan knows he can snare you with. Whether it's something that's on TV, whether it's something that's on the internet, whether it's, it's gossip or whether it's um, whatever it is. A drink, a drug. Backbiting between family. Whatever that temptation is, whatever that issue is, whatever that stronghold is in your life, Satan knows he can use it in your life to distract you from doing what you've been called to do. He does it in your personal life, and he does it in the church body. You know, as a church body, we can get distracted too. We get wrapped up in programs and and. Uh, groups and different things and we have outings and we have fellowships and we do everything else but at the end of the day are those fellowships helping us reach anybody with the gospel or are we just busy patting ourselves on the back we have to make that assessment because we got to strive for the goal you know we think 60, 70, 80, 85, 90 years on earth, that, that's a good long life, good, healthy, long life. Glad somebody could live that life. But when we get to eternity, 80 years is a drop in a bucket. It's not even a drop. It's like a vapor in a bucket. So you don't have time to just sit around and do anything or do nothing. We've got a job to do. Are we doing it? You know, the little things that hinder us, they seem insignificant. You know, I'll, I'll just stay home from church this, this one time, or I'll just watch this on TV, or, you know, I'm just not going to pray tonight. I'm tired, and the Lord understands, and the little, thing, the little things add up. You ever have a leak, and you put a bucket under there, and that water drip, just drip, 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 and next thing you know, the bucket's full. If you got a runner, weight matters. Nike and these other companies out there, you know, they spend millions of dollars in developing running shoes. There's a science behind tennis shoes, running shoes. And they're always looking for the newest material that's the lightest, that's the most durable, that'll last, not last too long because they want you to buy more shoes, but last long enough. And they're always looking for that new material, that new foam or that new uh, netting, whatever it is, to be lighter. And you could take, for example, a running shoe from the 70s or 80s and hold it in one hand and take a running shoe from today, and it, it's a world of difference in the weight. Why? Because every ounce of weight matters when you're running. That's why running clothes aren't 
aren't as heavy anymore and they're, they're light and they're breathable and there's a, a science behind it all for the runner to be the most aerodynamic and the lightest they can be for professional runners or marathon runners. There's a, there's a reason for it. And in running this race of our Christian faith, if I just get bogged down with this one sin over here and this one lapse over here and not reading my Bible as I should over here and not praying as much as I should over here, it starts adding up and the weight just builds and builds and builds. And next thing you know, it's hard to run. And you know, every, every once in a while, you'll run into a storm that tests your faith. And it's hard to run. You know what I'm talking about? Those, those times in your life where you question and where you have trial and you have tribulation and it's hard to run and you're running and it seems like you're running uphill and you're not getting anywhere. Those times are useful as well. Those times are like, if you've ever seen a runner, sometimes they wear a weighted vest or they weigh, wear weights around their ankles or so I've seen them even have like parachutes that they run with that kind of resist. And then when they take it off, they run even faster. So for the Christian faith, when we face that storm and that trial, and it's hard to run and we're pushing forward, and it seems like we're grinding up a hill and we all we see is the hill in front of us. I mean, it's steep. And the trials that we face, when we reach the top of the mountain... And we could run down that mountain. We're running ten times faster than we were going up. And we're running easier than when we were going up. And why? Because the Lord gave us the strength to go through that because we kept our eyes on Him. Am I speaking to anybody tonight? You kept pressing forward. You kept pressing for that goal. Those heavenly things. We've got to have freedom from our past, freedom to resist and move beyond temptation. Are you there yet? It's time to step out in faith, to get rid of those hindrances, to shake them off. You know, one of the biggest steps of faith that one can have is tithing. And I'm not going to stay on this too long. Stay awake. Don't turn me off. I just talked about money. I got it. But a step of faith is tithing. Especially on a fixed income. You got no extra income coming in. You've got these bills. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. And you know where every dollar is going. And you step out in faith and tithe. He will bless you every time. That's just one example. But that's what I'm talking about. Keeping our eyes on the prize. On the finish line. Not getting distracted with worry and fret and grief and anxiety and issues and sin and temptation. But keep moving forward. So as we let go of the past and we press forward, what does that look like? So I've got the past behind me, all my issues, all my worries, all my struggles, all the scars, all the hurt, all the shame, all the guilt. I've got the distractions around me of temptation and and the, the roses and everything going on around me, and I'm supposed to be running forward not being distracted by any of it. What's that look like tonight? What takes place? Look again at our original text. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things that are before. This morning we talked about straining towards the goal. We've talked about leaving the past behind. We talked about pressing forward. But to take Paul's thought further, the next thing we need to see in straining for this goal is maturity makes a difference. Spiritual maturity makes a difference. It makes all the difference in the world. Look at Philippians 3.15. It says, Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if any... Thing, be ye otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. The ESV says this, it says, let those things, let those of us that are mature think this way. 
essentially is what the beginning of the verse is saying. Let those of us that are mature think this way. As many has been perfect in the way of maturity. You've worked. You've mastered. Paul is saying to those who are mature Christians, you should be thinking and acting as Paul is. A mature Christian can let the past go. A mature Christian isn't going to be distracted by temptation. A mature Christian learns to forgive the past and move forward. A mature Christian is wise enough and smart enough to realize that not forgetting the past, not forgiving the past, and not letting the past go is a hindrance to their spiritual walk. And a mature Christian realizes and understands that giving in to temptation hinders their spiritual growth and walk. And a mature Christian understands that God's Word is our defense to fight against temptation. And that's why they're constantly and consistently in God's Word, studying God's Word, hearing God's Word, reading God's Word, and praying God's Word. This is a mark of a mature Christian. A mature Christian looks past all of that and, and strains for the goal. They are heavenly minded, fixated on Jesus. And they understand that they have a mission and a job to do on this earth to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're not ashamed of the gospel, they're not embarrassed. They're not worried that they're not going to say it right. They're not worried that they're not going to have all the answers. Because they step out in faith and know that the Holy Spirit can use them and speak through them, even through their bumbling and their fumbling and everything else. Are you mature tonight? Are you a mature Christian? A mature Christian looks to the past for insight and wisdom and experience. A mature Christian has let go of the pain of the past, has worked through the process of forgiving those who've hurt them, has learned to forgive yourself, and you're not stuck in that guilt and shame any longer. A mature Christian sees and understands the wisdom and freedom that comes from letting go. Are you mature tonight? Or is there something still snagging you? Still hindering you? Still bothering you? Paul says, And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. So, as we mentioned, the importance of prayer and Bible reading. As a, as a defense against Satan and his attacks and temptation. But prayer and Bible reading is also used to make us mature. Because how is the Holy Spirit going to speak to me if I'm not reading God's Word to feel the conviction, to grow in wisdom? How is the Holy Spirit going to speak to me if I'm not in prayer and supplication with Him? He's going to try to convict me and let me know I need to, to read my Bible, that I need to spend time in prayer, that I need to fellowship with Him. But I'm not going to grow We should pray for the Lord to keep us focused on His priorities, on His priorities, His will, and His purpose. Too many times we're so fixated on our will, our purpose, our priorities, not His. We have our minds on other things, on other distractions. So where are you at tonight? See, the Holy Spirit can reveal these distractions, but we have to spend time in prayer and asking for Him to reveal it to us. Is there something in your life that's a distraction? Is there something in your life hindering? Is there something in your life that, that's keeping you from being in close to Him? I think we all can say yes. I think we all can. 
We should continually pray to be reminded of this. At the same time, in the process of truth for the Bible reading, we pray consistently to be heavenly minded. See, if I don't open this up, and I don't read it, and it just sits on my table or on my bookshelf or wherever I set it, or in my car on the back dash so the sun can beat it down and, and tan it. You see that a lot? I see it a lot. I don't think about heavenly things until maybe next Sunday. Or if I don't go to church every Sunday, maybe whenever I wake up and feel like it, if I wake up on time. So we're not heavenly minded, we're earthly minded. And we go to church every now and then to make ourselves feel better. Being heavenly minded, I'll have this open. And I will daily think about God. And I will daily think about His Word. And I will daily think about glory and heaven and eternity. And I will daily think about His will for my life and what He wants me to do. And I will walk in this thought. Pressing forward. I will use Scripture as I open it daily and read it and understand it and digest it and pray it over my life, I will use it to resist temptation. Are you doing that? Or is there something that's stuck in your crawl, as they say? It got off quiet once I started talking about spiritual maturity because that requires work. See, just because you're old doesn't mean you're mature. Just because you've been a Christian 20, 30, 40 years doesn't mean you're mature. You can be a toddler in an adult body. It's quiet. Spiritual maturity has everything to do with how much Scripture you consume and how much time and prayer that you consume. And how heavenly minded you are to the point that your first thought and reaction to anything is how God is going to take care of it. When you're faced with difficulties in life, you think about God. When you think about the good things in life, you think about God. When you have questions in your life about maybe what you should do, what kind of job you should get, where you should go to school, all those different things, you think about what would God want you to do. That's called radical nowadays. That's called fanatic, fundamentalist. You get mocked, you get laughed at. You get laughed at when you tell somebody, well, I need to pray about that before I, I take action. Or I don't know if the Lord wants me to do that. When we start saying things like that, people laugh at us. So it got to the point that we don't really say it anymore. And then it got to the point that we really don't do it anymore. Because maybe they were right. Maybe we are weird. Maybe we are strange. And Paul said we are strangers. And for strangers in a strange land, that means we're strange. To the people around us, we are strange. Because we're strangers. We don't belong here. We're passing through. And that's how we should be acting. We should be acting like we're strangers, different from everybody else, passing through and having our eye on the prize of reaching home, which is eternity in heaven, with God. Oh, you are awake. Spirit maturity has less to do with how others in the church perceive you and more to do with how close you actually are with God. You can be the best dressed. You can put the most money in the offering plate. You can get up here and be the best, best vocalist God has ever blessed with a voice. But that has nothing to do with your spiritual maturity. In fact, I dare to say that if you're more concerned about these things in the church, the small things, the petty things, 
how this looks or how this acts or how this is conducted or how's this organized or, or the small minutia of things and you're worried about that and you just can't sit and enjoy being in the presence of God and in the presence of other Christians, then probably you're the toddler throwing a fit. Now, don't get mad at me. I knew I'd be preaching this on Sunday night to the Sunday night crowd. I know you're the faithful. I know you're the devoted. But sometimes because we are so earthly minded or we get distracted, we start getting in the minutia of the things, the weeds of things, and we start uh, picking this apart and picking that apart and this aggravates us and that aggravates us and we start complaining about this and complaining about that. And next thing you know, we're not enjoying our fellowship we're not exhorting one another. We're not lifting each other up as we're supposed to do by Hebrews 10, 25, right? We're supposed to exhort and lift one another up. We come in and we're just weighed down by the minutia and we're weighed down by the small things and we're worried about them and we're picking everything apart and we're complaining and we're griping. That's how Satan uses the body against itself. That's not spiritual maturity. That's not heavenly minded. We're to be heavenly minded. We're to be spiritually mature. Yes, this crowd here tonight, I expect you to be the spiritual mature ones for the church because you're the dedicated ones. You're the backbone of the church. You're the ones that's here no matter what. I knew that over half the people weren't going to come back tonight, this morning, when I said, everybody come back. I knew it wasn't going to happen. But I knew you were going to be here. Because you're the backbone of the church. But to be honest, being the backbone of the church and the spiritual mature ones, sometimes we get distracted. And we get bogged down. And that's when we have to re regroup. And reassess. What's our priorities? Is our eyes on the prize? Are we looking to heaven? Are we trying to reach the lost? Are we trying to do God's will for our life and for this church and for this community? Or are we more worried about fellowships? Are we more worried about our classes? Are we more worried about the different nuances of, of, of style and this, that, and the other that's going on? What are we concerned about? Because if we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ and we live in His will and we digest His Word and we spend time in prayer, when we come together, our spirits are going to connect and they're going to be in lockstep together because if I'm at home praying and reading my Bible and you're at home praying and reading your Bible, when we come together, we're going to come together for God's will to be done and we're going to be in lockstep for His will to be done in our lives and in our church and in our community. But when we're not mature, it's like a kid sitting at the adult table and trying to carry a conversation. They can't do it. They try. And the adults sit around and they smile and they try to carry the conversation with them. Been there? Seen it? Happened most of my life. I was an only child. So I didn't have a kid's table. So you get the pleasantries, you get the smiles, you try to carry the conversation, try to act adult, but you're not mature. And that can be evident in the church as well. When there's a bunch of spiritual mature people and a toddler walks in the room. And I don't mean to be offensive. I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings. But I need you to be honest with yourself before God. He already knows the answer. Are you spiritually mature? Or are you that awkward teenager who thinks he knows better than everybody else? Or are you the toddler pitching a fit? You know that. You know the answer. 
So what I encourage everybody to do, whether we are the mature one or whether we're the toddler or whether we're the teenager, we need to go home and do some more prayer. And we need to do more Bible reading because as a church, we've got to continue to press forward for the next 50 years, for the next generation, for the, the, the next step, the next chapter that God has in store for this church, whatever it is, whoever it is. Because this church was here with a vision before the city grew up around it. And you see it in the videos. I see farmland. I see grass. I see dirt. I see rocks. I don't see street lights. I don't see roads. I don't see houses. The Lord knew that He was putting this church here for a reason. And He has a responsibility for this church as the city grew up around the church, to reach the city that grew up around it. Are we doing that? And are we, be the, are we being the most effective we can be in doing that? Because we've got to be good stewards of what, with what the Lord gives us. Are we being good stewards? We need to make an impact reaching people with the gospel. Everything we do, everything we say, and everything that we are in this church needs to give glory to God. You know, I don't know if you read the bulletin this morning. There was a, a fact in there about Generation Z. You know it's not a dirty word anymore to be an atheist. It's not a shocker. It's not a bad thing. In fact, it's kind of celebrated. It's the norm. And it's almost doubled in the past little bit that the next generation coming up, Generation Z, there's more atheists in it than there are any other generation before it. And I say that because we have to reach the lost. That's the point of this race. The point of this race is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and to reach the lost around us. Are we doing that? Because the sign of maturity also shows that you do hard work when nobody else will do it. Think about it in our lives as adults. This new term that they call it adulting. Adulting is hard, as they say on the internets. I go to work. I may not like my job. I may work long hours. I went to school to get a job. I went to school to get an education to get a job, to get a good-paying job, whatever. There's decisions that each and every one of us have made in our lives to bring us to this point, and we are either working hard now or we've worked hard in our lives because we need to make ends meet, we had responsibilities. We had to get a, a roof over our head and over our family's head. We had bills to pay. We had to get food on the table. It's called responsibility. That's maturity. And the same principle applies in our Christian life. We have a job to do, and a mature Christian knows there's a job and will work towards that job because that's what our, our Lord and Savior has called us to do. Where an immature Christian will say, well, somebody else will do it. I'm too tired. I'm not smart. I don't have talent. Name the excuse. But a mature Christian, one way or another, may not be the best in the world, may not have the most talent, may not have the most skill, but they will work and work and work and work and work till the job is done. Or until the Lord sends somebody else to replace them. But most of the time what happens is they work and work, the Lord develops that maturity in them, and they get better at it. And the Lord continues to use them and bless them. Because they're faithful Faithfulness comes from maturity. Are you mature tonight? Are you willing to work when the work is there to be done and when it's hard work? I 
You know, we can sit here and go through the status quo because we're comfortable. But like I said this morning, you know, you have those churches out there celebrating 100 years of existence and it looks exactly the same as it did 100 years ago. That's not a sign of maturity. That's a sign of failure and laziness. This church for 50 years has been mature as a church body and worked hard. But we have to stay vigilant, pressing towards the goal. It's our responsibility now and the generations to come, the kids up in their classes now, the next generation will one day pass it on to them. And it will be their turn to make sure this church hits a 100-year mark and a 150-year mark and a 200-year mark. And the city is going to continue to grow up around us until the Lord comes back. But for here and now, it's our responsibility. And we'll be held accountable when we get to heaven and stand before a, a judgment seat of Christ. I want to hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that should make us shout tonight. If you're a Christian, you strive to hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I don't want my works burn up and tested by fire and to have them evaporate. I want the crowns. And I want the crown so I can put them at his feet. Because he's worthy of them. That's spiritual maturity. That's what it should look like as we're running this race. We should be focused, zeroed in. For his will to be done. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we're thankful for your word. And Lord, I know tonight was a little harder to swallow than it was this morning. But I also know the faithfulness of those that are here tonight. I know the faithfulness of your people. And Lord, I pray for this church and I pray for each and every person that's represented here tonight. And I just pray your will be done. And Lord, I pray that you challenge us as we move forward as a church. That we will press for the goal and that we won't be hindered by the distractions around us and we won't let our past stop us from moving forward into doing what you have called us to do as individuals and as a church of believers we thank you Lord tonight if you need to come to the altar it's open just come and whatever the distractions are whatever the past is whatever's going on just leave it on the altar.